Hey everyone, it's Thursday, so that means it's time for our weekly compilation video. This week we've been really delving into lichen sclerosis, looking at not only kind of correct diagnosis and treatment for the condition, but how patients with LS can talk to their healthcare providers, and then we also discuss some sexual um, health and sexual care for patients with LS as well. Um, I've been working with Jacqueline at the Lost Labia Chronicles um, this week, so make sure you check out her um, you know, Instagram page, and she has a blog and all sorts of great stuff over there, great resources. So. Um, um, you know, make sure you check her out. So now I, I spoke, you know, a couple months ago about lichen sclerosis on my lichenoid dermatosis video, and, and that's on YouTube as well. So you can check that out for more of an overview. But in, in terms of today, I'm really kind of wanting to focus deeply on this one condition. So just to kind of go over, you know, what LS is, LS is basically a chronic inflammatory condition that affects the skin. Um, and typically in the gynecology um, office, we will see it affecting the skin of the vulva. Remember, that's the external genitalia the perineum, and the perianal region. Now, I've also seen it on a patient's breast before. You can have it like on your arm. You can have it really anywhere there's skin, but typically areas of thinner skin are going to be the ones that are most affected. Now, this is not to say that, um, you know, you sh if you see something, you're like, oh, that's thin skin, that must be lichen sclerosis. Well, no, that's not really how it works, but um, if a patient comes in per, uh, complaining of symptoms that are consistent with it, it definitely warrants investigation. So, and, and what are those symptoms? You know, the, the most common initial presenting symptom for lichen sclerosis is itching. And this is typically itching that in the beginning of the disease is kind of intermittent, or you may notice that certain things kind of trigger it, certain foods or activities. And if it's not treated, it kind of progresses to the point where it becomes an all-encompassing type of thing. It can wake people up in the middle of the night due to itching. Um, and with, then when there's itching, a lot of times they're scratching. And when they're scratching, there can be infections. So you can have patients that develop skin infection because of this. The other thing that we see with LS is that the skin actually breaks down. And so you can have ulcerations of the tissue. Um, in, uh, the female external genitalia, the other thing that we'll see is a reabsorption of labial structures. You may have patients with really advanced LS or even only moderately advanced LS that they may not really have a differentiation between their labia majora and labia minora. The clitoral hood can fuse and you can actually get portions of the labia minora that end up closing up on the top and basically shutting off the clitoris as a whole. So there's a wide variety of, of presentations for this and obviously no two patients are alike. But you know, one of the hallmarks of lichen sclerosis versus something like lichen planus is that you don't typically see any vaginal involvement of the LS, whereas you can with lichen planus. So um, obviously, like I said, there are always exceptions for things, but that's one of the main things that we see. So now typically patients will come in, you know, having seen their primary care provider or maybe another gynecologist and being told, oh, you have a yeast infection. Um, and, you know, I always ask the patient, well, did they do a culture for yeast? And unfortunately, the majority of the time, the answer is no. Um, sometimes these patients aren't even actually examined. They, you know, they call up, they say, man, I'm really itching. The, you know, other provider or nursing staff or whoever says, oh, sounds like a yeast infection. Here's some Diflucan or here's some, you know, Monistat or topical cream, whatever it may be. And a lot of those medications have a mild anti-inflammatory in them, so it may improve symptoms temporarily, but the thing that you have to understand is that you're not actually treating the disease itself. And so these symptoms kind of keep recurring and reoccurring over and over again, and the patient keeps calling back and back and back until you have a patient that says, well, I've been treated for yeast seven times in the last six months, and I still have it. And they come in and I'm like, well, did anyone ever culture you for yeast? Well, no. And so, you know, you check and there's no yeast. They have lichen sclerosis. Like it's a very, you know, it, it happens unfortunately more often than not. So remember that the gold standard for diagnosing LS is a punch biopsy or a skin biopsy um, that's performed typically in the office, but we can perform in the operating room as well. Um, in this biopsy, we take a little, you know, two to four uh, millimeter size uh, portion of skin, send it off to the lab and have it evaluated for very specific histiologic changes. Um, if you're a histology nerd, what you're looking for is an absence of reedy ridges and basically an increased lymphocytic infiltrate into the tissue. 
Now, what you'll see basically on the skin itself is that the skin, the skin can become much more um, kind of raised or lichenified, hence the lichen sclerosis. It can be thicker in um, kind of texture. Um, and one of the other hallmark signs we see is significant hypopigmentation or whitening of the skin itself. And this can be very mild or this can be really severe. And in patients who have very pale skin, this can even be a little bit more harder to pick up. But the other thing we'll often see is kind of a glassy appearance on that skin too. So if you are doing your own genital exams, which I recommend that everyone does, and you say, hey, that skin is starting to look a little bit different, and yeah, that has been itching or so, you need to go get evaluated and checked out. Now, I had someone send a message in saying, have you noticed that patients report increasing um, tenderness in those biopsy areas when they have their flares? And that's a really great, great question. And, you know, obviously, if you're disrupting the skin there and you're creating more of a scar tissue that's filled in, well, the, the you know, punch biopsies really aren't getting you know, they're not getting all the way all, you know, into the muscle or things like that. A lot of them, unfortunately, are, are just very superficial. So yeah, you can see a, you know, change kind of in the way the, the tissue responds to that trauma. And it definitely can be a lot more tender um, with flares. Um, you know, I think honestly, you know, you're also disrupting nerve roots whenever you do biopsies. And once again, even though, you know, it fills in with scar tissue, you still then have raw kind of nerve surfaces that are there too. So, you know, like I said, that, so definitive treatment is going, or excuse me, definitive diagnosis is going to be punch biopsy. You know, if you're really, really, really good, you may be able to look at something and say, hey, that's lichen sclerosis, but at the same time, you still can't say for sure. You need to have that biopsy. So that's, I will go to my grave saying biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. Now, in terms of treatment, the big issue we worry about with untreated lichen sclerosis, especially in the postmenopausal population, is the fact that LS can transform into squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. Um, this occurs in about 5 to 10% of the, of the time of these patients who are untreated. So that's kind of the big long-term scare. Now, obviously, quality of life stuff. Um, you know, you're looking at itching, you're looking at pain with intercourse, and not to mention a lot of the psychologic or psychologic issues that we see um, with kind of a chronic disease state, especially one that's affecting our genitalia. Um, the gold standard of treatment for LS is the use of an ultrapotent steroid. Here where I am in the U.S., a lot of times we'll use a medication called clobetazole or Timivate. Um, there are a wide variety of other ultrapotent steroids, but that's typically the medication that is used. Now, there is a concern when you use ultrapotent steroids about tissue breakdown. You know, I, I maybe I've been lucky, but the way that I kind of tell patients to use, to use this, I have yet to have a patient that had any significant type of tissue breakdown. Um, you know, I, I know that some people will apply this two, three, four times a day. If you're using the, the clobetazole ointment, you really don't need to apply it once a day at most. It has a really long half-life. Um, clobetazole cream, a little bit maybe of a difference there, and that's just in that preparation. But for that reason, I typically just prescribe the ointment. Um, it has a less al or a lower alcohol content as well, so it's gonna make application less burny and irritating to the tissue if there is any type of tissue breakdown. Now I'll see my patients in a very kind of regimented schedule after I diagnose them with LS and they're doing that clobetazole daily and then maybe moving to every other day and then twice a week, you know, and then to maybe once a week once the disease is really well controlled. But I still recommend patients apply that medication daily, or excuse me, once a week, even if they're not having an outbreak at all to try and prevent, you know, any type of occurrence or, or flare from occurring. Now, for some patients, the, you know, steroids may not be an option, so there are alternative treatments. Some of the most promising ones we have are the use of what are called calcineurin inhibitors, medications like picrolimus or tacrolimus. These go in and basically kind of affect the way that your body responds to um, this type of inflammatory reaction. Um, now, these don't have as good as a, um, you know, a efficacy rate in preventing the type of skin cancer changes or skin cancer risk, but you still can see a good relief and reduction in, in inflammation and symptoms with these um, calcineurin treatments. For patients who are in low hormone state, so postmenopausal patients not on hormone therapy or um, pre, uh, you know, women who have not gone through puberty yet, you may also want to consider adding a topical estradiol 
estradiol or maybe even a, a DHEA like estradiol slash testosterone there um, to help that tissue um, reinvigorate as well. The other thing when you're applying the medication, you really want to make sure you're soaking in warm water before you put the cream on to try and help it absorb quicker into the skin and kind of work better. Um, Experimental therapies for um, you know LS are definitely out there. Um, low intensity light therapy or kind of cold laser therapy has shown some benefit in studies. Um, I have some patients that are on immunologic uh, medications or biologics, excuse me, for things like Crohn's disease or rheumatoid arthritis or um, um, ulcerative colitis. And they actually have seen a reduction in some of their, you know, symptoms since they've been on those biologics. Now, once again, that, that's not the gold standard, that's more experimental, but that is something that can be used too. Um, you know, platelet-rich plasma I spoke about earlier, that's, you know, something that can be used as well. Um, that's going to definitely reduce symptoms and help kind of with tissue rebuilding. The big question is with any of these alternate therapies though, is are you getting the same reduction in cancer risk? And I know that's kind of long-sighted for a lot of patients that are saying, but I'm suffering right now, but it is something we wanna keep in mind. But, you know, I was talking to a patient this morning talking about, you know, autoimmune diseases in general. And, you know, back 10, 15 years ago, we treated autoimmune diseases like, you know, uh, rheumatoid arthritis with steroids. And then we would use medications that kind of affected the way that your body processed immunity. And now we're treating those more and more with these biologic medications, like infusions that you get, you know, once a month or things like that. And my hope and my thought is that in the future, that will kind of be the, the definitive treatment for LS, you know, that we're going to get to the point where we can treat it just with that type of medication alone. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. Now, surgically speaking, if you have clitoral hood adhesions, that's something that we can definitely go in and kind of open up, you know, make sure if you're going to have that done, if you have that fusing of the clitoral hood, see someone who's, who does that, who knows what they're doing. Don't just go see your average, you know, practitioner for that. Um, same with PRP, you know, find someone that's, that's not just doing that to make some extra money. You know, once again, really try and find uh, providers that know kind of what they're doing with this condition. And I'll once again, you know, throw out that the International Society for the Study of Vulvovaginal Disorders or the ISSVD has a list of, of providers that are kind of vulvovaginal dis disease nerds and, you know, really like to, you know, take pride in treating this, these conditions and, and diagnosing them properly. So there's, there's that to consider. Um, so now let's say that you've, you know, you've been diagnosed, you saw someone, you know, maybe you have to move or whatever it is. How do you talk with another provider about this? Well, you know, if, first of all, if you find someone who knows what they're talking about and you say, Hey, I have LS and they're like, Oh, you know, tell me about your therapies. Great. You don't really have to do too much there. But if you find someone that doesn't know, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is to, you know, be on a successful treatment regimen, have someone go in and say, well, I'm just going to put you on, you know, Cordaid or something like that. No. So, you know, bring kind of a little, little folder and say, hey, this is what I've been on. This is what really works for me in the past. You know, I've been biopsy diagnosed. Like, I know this is what this is. This isn't just someone saying, I think this is this condition. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you are concerned you may have this, ask your provider, hey, you know, I'm having this itching. I'm having these, you know, color changes. I'm not responding to like over-the-counter treatment. I'm worried this may be lichen sclerosis. Do you think you could investigate that? Or do you think you could refer me to someone who, who does that? Um, and, and hopefully they will say, yes, that's fine. If they don't, you need to find another provider, honestly. Um, but, you know, it's something that unfortunately, in, at least in gynecology training, we don't get a lot of vulvovaginal disorders. I know that's crazy, but really OBGYN residency is about delivering babies and taking out uteruses. It's really not about the day in and day out of things. So, you know, you have to find someone that's done extra, you know, training in this to really know what they're doing. Um, so just, you know, ask, ask your provider, how much, how many LS patients do you have? Do you see this a bunch, you know, and obviously you can do it in a non-combative or non-aggressive sort of way. Um, but if something doesn't sound right to you, you know, you can always get a second opinion. It's, it's your body. You have that choice to do that. Um, so, so, you know, that, that would be my kind of advice for that, kind of how to address that, how to talk to that provider about that. Now, things that, you know, that often go hand in hand with LS, but aren't really discussed or are a lot of the sexual concerns that we see. 
And not only is this, am I talking about low libido, but I'm also talking about some sexual pain issues that, that happen as well. Now, like we talked about yesterday, you know, neuroplasticity is the buzzword for the week. And this is basically your brain's ability to take behavior and to translate it or to take, you know, um, experiences and to translate that into behavior. So I know that if I shut my hand in a drawer, it's going to hurt. I've shut my hand in a drawer enough to know, yep, that hurts. I don't want to do that. Even if someone says, Corey, it's not going to hurt anymore. I'm probably not going to shut my hand in a drawer. You know, it's the same with sex. If sex is painful, if sex hurts, you're not going to want to do it. And even if you take away the thing that's causing that pain, there's still that like apprehension or that concern that this is going to be painful. And, and so a lot of times people don't want to, to engage in that. You know, um, giving someone something like phlebanserin, which is a fantastic medication for hypoactive sexual desire disorder, is not going to work in this case. You know, I talked about that last week with, with Addy. Like on the decreased sexual desire screener, there's a question that says, are there other health concerns that could be contributing to your low libido? This is one of them, folks. Like, so don't just take Addy and think it's gonna work. Like, no, you have to address the LS and you have to address the psychology behind that. Remember, trauma is a like, and this, this is trauma. This is repetitive trauma, whether that's from experiences where it's hurting or it's painful or it's emotional trauma, because you say, what is my body doing to myself? What, what, what is going on with my genitalia? This very private, like individualized portion that we hide from the world. What is going on? Why is it failing me? So this is definitely trauma. And trauma is like someone taking a file and putting it on top of a filing cabinet. You know, if your memories are those files in the cabinet, no matter when you go in there and you're looking for the files, that file is sitting on the top. And there's nothing you can do to not let it shadow what's going on in the cabinet itself. So you want to engage or get some, you know, of these kind of trauma redu reducing therapies. I talk about EMDR a lot, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. That's probably my favorite one, but there are other ones out there too, to help address the psychologic aspect of this chronic, you know, condition and the things that go along with it. So really try and find a provider that's going to work with you, not only from your physical LS, but your emotional LS too, your mental LS, because like in sclerosis, it is a skin disorder but it also affects things up here. You know, this is the same for sexual medicine, just for, for any of these things. Like you cannot separate your genitalia from your sense of self. If we did, if, you know, we wouldn't be covering it all day. Like, and, and so if something is bothering your genitals, it affects how you view yourself and how you interact with other people around you, regardless if it's a sexual situation or not. So you need to find someone who will work with you to address that. Um, you know, pain issues with LS, as that tissue becomes more scarred, it doesn't give. And so, you know, working with physical therapists, working with dilator therapy, sometimes can be really helpful to try and kind of help things open up. I have patients that use viscous lidocaine when they have sex, and that's totally fine too. But the goal is going to be to reduce this so you don't have the pain with intercourse. And that's where all these therapies kind of come in into play. So, um, you know, ask your provider, okay, so, hey, I know you say I have LS. What can we do about my sex life? Like, this is really affecting you know, how I relate to my partner. This is relate, affecting how I relate to myself. And if they don't give you answers you want, then you need to find someone who will. So, you know, the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, this is ISWISH, not the ISSVD, um, has a list of providers that, you know, really specialize this and take the time to find, you know, um, you know the, the root cause of this. And there are some of us that are on both of those, you know, myself, uh, you know, Iswish and, and ISSVD, Jill Krapf, who I know a lot of you know um, from her work with lichen sclerosis, she's on there too. Um, you know, Nisha McKenzie up at Women's uh, Health or WH Collective up in, in Michigan, she's on there. I mean, uh, there's a bunch of us that are on it. So find someone that knows what they're doing. Um, this video is getting really long. It's almost 20 minutes. So if you're still with me, thank you so much for, for tuning in and, and staying. But I'm very passionate about LS, and I want to make sure that if you have this condition, you are treated appropriately, and that the people who are taking care of you are taking care of all of you, you know, not just the you in your under parts. So anyway, if you have questions, reach out. Um, otherwise, I'm Corey Babb. I'll talk to you next week, and have a wonderful weekend.